everybody and welcome back to the DMs Book Club. I hope you are doing well. My name is Ryan. I'm hosting this week because I've been allowed the reins in the <laughs> sort of every two week permissions slip that I get given and it's brilliant. But look who I've got here. It's only Fiona. What? Wait. I, <laughs> is that not your what? name? Only Fiona. <laughs> only Fiona. <laughs> I thought it was. How are you? I am really good, Ryan. Yep. Um, I'm on holiday currently. It is amazing not to be strapped to your computer eight hours a day, even though I am doing it for this and for other things. But it's nice to be wanting to do it rather than being just forced to do it. So. I was going to say, a typical day off for you surely involves being at your screen for at least eight hours a day. Yeah, but I think, I don't know, there's something I, I was talking to, I was talking to my mother about this, funnily enough. I said there's something about being on call, as I like to call it at work, where yeah. I'm just there waiting for something to go wrong so that I can fix it, compared to where I'm actually doing things that I want to do and actually you know, have set myself like I can do an hour of editing, I can do an hour of writing and not suddenly have like, oh my God, my computer's doing something. Fiona, can you help me you know so yeah makes a difference yeah being on call it just sort of you, you feel like you've got to always be alert and outside of what you're trying to do no I get that that, that yeah. makes sense staying yeah. alert always alert <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of staying constantly alert mm. we, we jump to the topic of today's podcast and yeah. this is Fiona's choice I was hinted last week Fiona Yes. What have you got for us this week? So this week, I thought, you know, you know what would be great if I actually do a theme. <laughs> um, so obviously, my first choice uh, for the for the second episode we did was Mind Flayers, and there was a tiny little mention of um, their sort of uh, the race that they had enslaved called the Gif, and how the Gif had done an uprising. I did an uprising, uh, and <laughs> I'd done an uprising, and sort <laughs> done of cast, it, done it, done, a, done an uprising, and, and we're now as a result, my players were sort of um, on this sort of skirts of uh, extinction. Mm. So I thought, why not? Because it was it was only briefly sort of mentioned this sort of gift. Actually, have a look at them because it's also in Mordecai's uh, Tomb of Foes, and it turns out there's a lot of stuff about gift that I don't know. And they're really interesting. <laughs> so I thought it'd they be a are. good choice. It was an interesting chapter. Yeah, I, I have to say the Mordecai and Time of Phones is, is, is really good for reading. I, it, as I said before, it's one of my favourite books. And this chapter, I think, is really good in the sense that it gives a bit of background, a bit of story, a bit of mechanics. It's sort of a real, like, mm. mix of things. Um, so where do you want to start? Tell us a little bit about the GIF and the Endless War. The Endless War. Well, so as we've sort of talked about before, the GIF were enslaved to the Mind Flayers for quite a long time. And at some point, um, one of them, who was called GIF, uh, led an uprising to defeat the Mind Flayers. And as a result, the GIF became their sort of own sort of entity, their own sort of race and their own sort of power. And then after that, when they started to talk about what kind of civilization they wanted, two sort of big factions came about. You have the Gith Yankee, which more I think most people will have heard of in some respects. They are sort of the more aggressive, um, mm. you know, fighting and violence is the way forward. You must destroy the enemy, etc. And more likely to sort of come out onto the uh, material plane. And then you have the Gifzari, who are sort of more philosophical, like best, the best sort of kind of society is one that's in seclusion who then decide to go live in the plains of Limbo, which we've talked about briefly in the last episode. So two very different sort of sides of the same coin. And as a result, you get a very interesting thing. They, bo they both have a common enemy, which is the Mind Flayers, but they both hate each other as well. And <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just something very interesting about the different cultures, I guess. Like the, again, the, it's like just where they've sort of divided off at a certain point just because of their certain beliefs and stuff and being led by two very, very different leaders but had the same goals in mind. Mm. So, yeah. It, it is a difficult... Like, when I was reading through it, it, it felt a little bit like these were the siblings of the D&D &D world. Two very similar but totally different people with a very weirdly similar like regime and, and how they function, but then a different interpretation of it. And they're trying to do the same thing. They can't help but bicker and fight every time they see each other. It is very sibling, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, the interesting that, because so the Gifzari are actually the younger uh, sibling race, as it were, because they were sort of born at the end of it, because then the Gif were allowed to, you know, go to read and to sort of have the skills. And therefore they're more interested in the arcane and stuff like that. So 
it's for me as sort of say the older sibling of two I, it's very weird because normally I would I would associate older siblings being the, the the wiser in you know in quotation marks one sort of like whereas the younger ones are sort of scrappy willing for a fight where it's the other way around and I think that's mostly because of the conflict obviously mm. these gith were sort of born in servitude and they were you know had told to tough it up they had to fight to get what they want and now that they have it they don't have certainly they don't maybe don't have time to to read and stuff but i think for me what's in the thing that stood out to me and again it's why i keep saying like sort of gith yankee are probably the most well known i find them they are the most interesting because they feel sort of paradoxical to me yeah so they're sort of described as you know warriors they're sort of like you know the fighting is what they do and they train and they train and they train and then they go out sort of uh, when they're about to turn into adulthood to uh kill a mind flayer and bring it back to their their sort of not home planet but their sort of home base which i ca- i did look this up before we got it. it's to Oh, turn, uh, turn her off. I mean, you can look yeah. at it all day on page and, and being able to then pronounce it is, I mean, you've picked another chapter for the difficult pronunciation. It's, mm. yeah, turn off. That's why. Turn, turn it off, yeah. yeah. That's what and I'd say. It's, uh, first of all, turn it off is a very cool place because it just mm. happens to be like the fossilized body or, or half a fossilized body of a godlike entity that's been dead for eons. <laughs> as you do. As you do. And then obviously they sort of go back, there's a huge parade, there's this adulthood, the raiding parties are the coolest thing. And then you sort of, uh, you, they sort of present it to their sort of queen, uh, Val Kith, who is, is, again, is sort of very determined. And her own story about how she sort of came and sort of overthrew Gith is, oh, it's so Game of Thrones-like. <laughs> Sending her off on a mission to the Nine Hells and they're just taking over is I just like I just found this character just so interesting to read about, and yeah. it's a really cool sort of maybe template for like if you want to come up with an evil genius that's sort of like or an a villain in some way that sort of worked their way up the ranks and now has has taken hold of of, of a race because that that's the thing I think neither the Gif Yankee or Gizari are good. And you think they would be good after being in servitude and being enslaved? They you know they did this uprising and now they're free, but now they're not good, and that. I think that's mind blowing in a way. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, they're very, very interesting and complex people. Because I think, yeah, the Gith Yankee are more typically your bad guys, aren't you? They are more willing to plunder, raid, steal, murder in order to not only do what they want to do, but because they sort of feel they have a right to it, don't they? Whereas the Gith Zeri are more, yeah, calculating, reserved, possibly more higher purpose orientated or maybe both have a high purpose it i think they, be... they don't like direct conflict i think that's what it is they like to avoid it no. when they can no the thing that i thought was really interesting about this chapter is you've picked two factions effectively yeah. that are located on different planes to the material plane yeah. which is something that in D D you don't necessarily have to deal with too much in my experience a lot of adventure has done the material plane we were talking about this the other day that most adventure is and most characters created and most stories are in that sort of level five to ten bracket and these these guys and, and where they live nothing about this chapter reads as this is a level five to ten <laughs> encounter this is this seems a lot more advanced and a lot more like the world is far bigger than you than you thought i mean what did you think about like the astral plane and, and limbo and, and how they're sort of how they work so the astral plane is interesting. Uh, again, I, I'm, 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 I feel like I'm going to be favouring the GIF, the GIF Yankee quite a bit, so I apologise for that. I'll, I do <laughs> I do have thoughts on Limbo, <laughs> just in general. But GIF Yankee, they made their home on the astral plane. And that's interesting because in the astral plane, you don't age, you don't need food mm. or, or anything like that, so you stay the same. Um, so obviously, when, when you're making warriors and stuff like that, you know, they're immature, they need to be out on the material plane or in a plane that, ages people so they can fight and stuff and then when they come back into the astral plane they don't age yeah. so as a result those gif yankee that are in the astral plane they don't age they don't need food and sustenance they get bored and they are spoiled and for me i just i i i, do, I know i'm going to say this a lot for all these podcast episodes like, oh it reminds me of this you know media reference but <laughs> i was getting very strong district one vibes from hunger games like there's like there's bits of like new projects that are like new statues or new artistry or whatever but it's only half done because they get bored mm. there's this fascination with uh, newness which i thought was really interesting that they they 
they're a civilization that thrives on violence and having a purpose. But when you take that purpose away, when you, you've taken sort of the limit of like, uh, mortality away, what do you do? Like, yeah. if they're not interested in like philosophy and stuff, they're just yeah. gonna, they just want to hoard things and they, this is pretty, this is nice. I have no use for it anymore. It's gone on the garbage pile. So there's that, I think, I can't remember where exactly in, in the sort of their, their home uh, planet is. But there's like just a huge trash pile of broken cities and broken things that they've taken from other yeah. other planets and it's left it there. They're very much like trash lantus. Yeah. You know, it's and oh, it so good. you can people can go into this part of this sort of yeah, the, the trash bit of the city and and not be discovered. No one would ever check in on you. It's just nobody cares about it. It's really yeah interesting yeah but there are a lot of paradoxes with how these guys are set up and, and the astral plane i think works really well with that you've got as you say they, they don't age they don't eat they don't sleep they get bored and then you've got um blacketh this sort of lich leader yeah. who is yeah, as you say just a whole other different can of worms and, and how that one works but she doesn't like them to be too engaged but at the same time she can't let them get too bored so you know is playing yeah. this sort of weird role with it she's yes yeah, she's in a really interesting situation where she has to send out warriors to keep them busy but then if they're too experienced they could challenge her authority so there's this thing uh i, I forget the name of it but like an ascension process where they're like you are you have you've been deemed worthy you should you we, you will ascend to a better place etc as the one of the greatest warriors to go and just, meet a gift yeah exactly. yeah and, and then she just absorbs their souls becoming a lich and that is incredible because i'm surprised no one's found out about this like <laughs> yeah yeah that, that's the ridiculous thing it, the, the, you basically she's a parasite she's mm -hmm. taken over this entire community and probably is one of the main reasons why they are still so evil mm -hmm. but just nobody can discover her she's too perfectly burrowed in it is very strange isn't it and, and i think if you and Going back to what you're saying about, I, again, it's if you if your if your party ever went to the astral plane and were uh, and came to sort of the capital where the Gif Yankee is, there was like two sort of reasons that the book gave was either that you're on some sort of secret mission and you are sneaking your in, or you're there at the behest of the Gif Yankee, i.e., you've been captured or you've you've been enslaved and you've been brought back as a sort of a prize or a treasure. That was just again really interesting because you won't go there for a holiday. <laughs> you don't go there as a tourist. You are no. you are either you are stranded, and yeah. that that was interesting. But then on the flip side, going to go the, the Gifzari, mm. they made they they're interesting. And again, like I said, you talked about it a little bit in the last episode. We talked about Limbo being a place of chaos and only the strongest of wills could live there and stabilize it and that's what the Gifsari are they can just stabilize huge what i again what i see is like district nine ships you know that film in district nine where it's just how mm. hovering over hovering over africa and that's why what i see just these huge big sort of fortresses that are just in limbo just hovering there and then transporting throughout the different planes depending on what the the will is of of the commander yeah it's fascinating it's absolutely crazy i'm just gonna go close my window quickly because there's a creepy say, ice cream truck can you hear it that is yeah. the creepiest thing it sits there in the car park with the most slow mm. ominous like horror call that's very so strange funny. very very strange that's so funny that. go for it go for it i would like 2.99 so if, if you're going did. Nobody uses it as well. It's so <laughs> slow. I was just, it feels it feels like something out of a horror film. It like, is. It, I, I swear it's from a horror film. Yeah, <laughs> it's mad. That's so, no, funny. You, so you're absolutely right. These and, and that I have to say is, is the picture in the book that really caught my attention the most. Not the flaming death ships of the Gif Yankee or the even the really cool hollowed out god skull that's being used as a city but it was that that citadel these adamantine citadels that can just go and and appear in the middle of nowhere and even though these guys aren't necessarily bad just having that essence of limbo in them mm. and the way they just corrupt the land around them and yeah, drive off yes. natural life and everything that's sort of normal is really 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 strange and like like I said, so their their leader, as it were, it, again names. Mm, I think it's Men <laughs> Menya Ag Gif. Um, <laughs> for me, that's a good pronunciation. I like that. Thanks. I've been working on it like for the last ten minutes. Uh, no, um, for me, it's that again. This person is 
so old their lifespan's been expanded not through lich means but some through some uh, psionic and arcane ability but they can't they're so decrepit the corpse like it's in the pit in the book it's like almost like a, a coffin um a sarco- a sarcophag- oh my god egyptian coffin there we go sarcophagus. there, <laughs> there we, we go, go. um <laughs> where this person can't move they they can't move an eyelid or anything like that but they can they can think and their ability to communicate with um oh, what they're called the is it it's not the angst it's the other ones isn't it uh, the people that create and, and move these fortresses about. Oh, the, the Anarchs. The Anarchs, that's right. He can communicate with all these Anarchs through over different planes and stuff and everyone can hear him. It must yeah. take, that, that instantly thinks that this guy could just squish you with just a little hint of his mind. That's, that's yeah. how powerful it is. And so that, that both these leaders are so, so again, they, they are old, older than you can imagine, but they are so powerful. It is actually quite... It's it's scary. Yeah. I don't think people. Even think, yeah. Mordekainen oh. in the book talks about how even he was awed by the power that this this creature could could muster effectively. It's um, it is amazing. I thought there was a lot of parallel between this chapter and the mind flare chapter, considering how much these guys hate mind flares. Both the Gift Yankee and the Gift Zeri essentially follow like a central figure that can psychically and, and, and command loyalty and can communicate using psionic like power, especially the Gifzari with this, mm. essentially this, this sarcophagus like creature that can just sit there. And even with the Gif uh, Yankee and, and the Lich, she sits in a, in a hollowed out elder brain. Oh. It does, the whole thing just screams mind flare, doesn't it? They, oh, they've moved yeah. on, but they really haven't in the way that they set their, their lives up. Yeah, the, the throne of bones, it's called. Uh, what Couldn't be more like. evil if it tried. In, it's the, just, in the hollowed out corpse of a god. Oh, it's just awful. Like, <laughs> yeah, you, if she's going for a mood, she's she's got it. Um, but I think <laughs> the thing that the thing that really struck me, yeah, it's the idea again, getting real sort of animal farm vibes, where it's like you overthrow a tyrannical power, but then become tyrants in yourselves. Like, like it's it's just that interesting sort of thing where you want to break free from horrid horridness but you don't yeah. necessarily know how else to act other than what you what you know and i oh yeah it, it felt yeah it's like how do you fill a, a power void like that in like obviously we've had this in obviously real life with politics you know where as soon as the central power is sort of gone was taken away from through, some force or through death then people are trying to rush in to fill it but yeah. don't necessarily want to work together and it's just oh I love it. I love politics. <laughs> More politics in D&D games, please. <laughs> exactly. When I was reading through this, the, the thing that struck me was that you've kind of got, again, two sides to both of these entities. You've got how they live on their home plane and then how they interact with the material plane, which is where they're going to normally be met with the players of any campaign most often. And whilst the methods are slightly different, the, the the common theme is the hunting of mind flares and and that really hasn't gone away has it mm, no it's they're definitely it's interesting because like i said i feel like mind flares you either put them into your campaign and you think about it a lot so without the mind flare element is there any real reason to have a gif yankee or give sari meeting them i guess but then, then it led me to this other thing because in the in the book it gives you the stats so if you wish to create a gif yankee or gif sari character and i did think to myself like because they are so cool but to role play one and you don't know necessarily know the background of it and whether i feel is it would be one of those things where and again i don't want to be like oh you need to be an experienced player and you need to know all this stuff <laughs> but i feel like cuz there's such there's such a lot of history in it that you you need to know at least the bare basics of it as a player but also discuss it with your dm so why would a gif yankee be with the, this party uh, of other adventurers that's you know when all they've done is they've grown up to be a warrior and to go hunt out mind flayers mm. is there a reason they're not they're not doing that anymore are they being conniving are they using the party for their own means and the gifsari they like you said they they transport these huge fortresses and they they stay away from conflict so what's this gifsari doing out of a fortress with a group of players so mm. it's it's one of those things where i think it gives you a lot a lot to play around with but you can't I personally feel like I would not feel comfortable without asking the DM. I would really want to play 
a, a gif of some sort, but does that fit into the setting? I can't really do it as, I, I even feel like a one shot might be tricky because mm. there's so much, I feel like, like I always say with one shots when I run them, especially with D&D one shots, it's like, I, it's great to have some backstory, but we don't have time to go through 30 pages of backstory. Yeah. The gif, ha- the gif have 10 pages and obviously you've got the mind flares as well. And that's that's a lot of baggage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so what would you do if you, if you wanted to put them into a story as a one shot? Would it be that you're trying to they they need help hunting mind flares, or characters have walked into a battle between two groups, or maybe there's like an outcome because they describe outcasts of, of both in sort of loose ways in terms of like you can just have these odd individuals that don't necessarily fit in or uh, off a material plane doing whatever. I mean, maybe you do it like that just on mm. on sort of isolated individuals i think there's that i think also because this is this is where i would struggle with because i feel like this i would love to have it that 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 they're off on a mission a different kind of mission maybe they're a secret mission but then they have to go back to uh to the astral plane or they have to go back to the the limbo to to so as a uh, not renaissance Ah, oh, a fact-finding mission, but it begins with R. Oh, oh a reconnaissance. <laughs> there you go. You were could, so close. Renaissance, um, I like. <laughs> God, could you imagine the gift wearing like Renaissance clothing? That's, <laughs> oh, that's a different one. Shot. Costumes are, are are similar, definitely very jewels, but very Ooh. like fancy. Yeah. Yeah, I, and sorry, jump me off that. Like the gift Yankee, they take tokens from their enemies say that i've done this etc so but the more ostentatious the more gaudy it is the better so i love the idea that the gith yankee are just covered in jewels and stuff but again they're they're great fighters but they're also spoiled and they they're 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 bored so i guess there is a lot to play with that sort of role play element yeah definitely but going back to that sort of question you were asking i feel it's one of those things where it would have to be a central story if, I, if it was a long campaign, it would have to be a central story thing. And it have, I'd have to have some buy-in from the players. And I think, I don't know, because th- it does, if it's just one player that's playing a Gith Yankee or a Gith Sari, I feel like it's going to spotlight quite heavily on them. So I feel it's a mixture of, they sort of have to be up to the t- challenge of knowing, like I said, the bare basics of like, okay, this, you know, you're not really supposed to be making friends on these missions. You, you know, you're looking down on, on these other places. Why would you yeah. make a difference? And and then the other players sort of buy in like, oh, your friend has to go back to the astral plane, but he, you know, need, would need help. Would you, would you go with them? Even though you would be treated incredibly poorly. You know, it's, I, feel, <laughs> I feel like it's, it's, it's a, I don't know, it's, it's, it would be an interesting experiment. I don't know if I... I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's like I said, it's fascinating, but I just don't know. I don't know how it would work. What about you? What would you, what would you do? Uh, Yeah. A long-term plot is difficult, isn't it? I I think I would rather bring characters into and dealing with the gif rather than playing as a gif themselves. I think if it was a gif, a Yankee, for instance, it could be somebody on the material plane, maybe from one of those nests that has been lost or Mm -hmm. abandoned by the group and has grown up individually potentially um, an outcast, somebody who has uh, been exiled but not killed for whatever reason, or maybe was on a mission and forgot the mission or failed the mission or, you know, and doesn't want to go back. A bit of backstory in that way. But yeah, these these are high-level characters, so it's Mm. difficult to necessarily think of it. But I think a good villain Mm. could be a member of the GIF in either way. That sort of, you know, stoic, stony all means to an end approach to things is quite interesting to play with. Mm-hmm, I mean, one thing I will ask is well, when you went through this as, as chapters, was there anything that jumped out at you as you really, really liked, like a favorite thing that, that stuck with, you know, stuck with you? Oh, okay. Really? This is just me being like, that's really cool. And I say, I say this about everything. And when I, when I sort of write it down, but their language, <laughs> that's really <laughs> cool. So it's, it's sort of done. And again, I know I'm like, oh, it reminds me of this. So in Doctor Who, Gallifreyan is written sort of in circles and almost like sort of different symbols, but within yeah. like one, a sentence or a paragraph is in one sort of circles. Similar with the GIF, it's sort of, it is written in a way, but GIF Yankee read it from sort of 12 o'clock clockwise and GIF Sari read it from six o'clock anti-clockwise. I know, which just is, to annoy each other. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just love that that sort of little well actually I think you'll find but I, I love that it could just mean completely different things just the way you start and obviously I know that only the gift could read that so there's that 
And then I really, I really love the idea. It's interesting because obviously the Mind Flayers, their ships I thought were rubbish. The Gif Yankees ships sound really cool. Like there's, <laughs> they've, you've got the astral skiffs and they sort of fleet around. And the picture in the book is again really cool, really iconic, mm, sort of really good artwork, it. isn't oh, it? So good, and they are controlled by gish who are very sort of uh very sensitive uh uh gif yankee who sit in almost like silver chairs with sort of like a, a bit over it so again it's a professor x style oh so cool i i am 100 percent down for down for stuff like that because that's that's again very tense you're battling you could have i'd love to be able to have a, like a one shot where you you are controlling a skiff in some way like do you want to bomb a settlement? I don't think so, but I don't know. Like, <laughs> see, I'm, I'm going to try and think not to bomb, but now it's all I can think about. Yeah, because you're like, ah! <laughs> don't think about it, don't think about it, yeah. No, they, they, the imagery is amazingly cool. I, I still, I love the idea of limbo. Like, I really do enjoy the, the sort of pure chaos and malleable, like, elemental forces that these guys have to sit there and their entire base is, is constantly being crumpled and, and threatened and they have to sit there and physically, psionically stop, like, limbo from encroaching onto their land. I find that fascinating, just from a, a point of view of, like, why, why are you here? Of all the places you could be. <laughs> but like, and like you said, when they go to a... When they are transported to a new plane... Everything within a certain certain distance it gets corrupted, and then once they're sort of finished with their sort of uh, with their mission, they disappear, and the land remains unchanged. Uh, and it's just again, again, that sort of parasitic sort of tainting of the land and people and and creatures sort of acting weird and stuff like that. Again, very sort of demon esque, as we've sort of talked about before. But yeah, that the idea that no matter where they go, chaos will always follow them and and impact the lands oh yeah uh, yeah i like that it's tainted them too much and <laughs> and yeah whilst it's so sort of safe it, it, it means that they kind of make things not safe mm. like yeah it, it, it's, it's really strange anything stood out for you that you didn't like any in like in, in terms of you know the ships the mind flares obviously was one real point that really got to you but is there anything on this this topic you, you know i really struggled it's, and that's I don't know whether that's because that's good. I don't know. I I I feel like I I don't know. I feel like I should always find fault with one thing, but I don't want to be that kind of person. I, I just I I feel and maybe maybe it's not really a criticism per se, but I feel there's sort of so with both of these factions hating each other, there is always going to be a resistance type group where the Gif Yankee and the Gifzari will come together. Oh, some members will and work secretly, secretly to unite them, but there is so little information on it because <laughs> I guess they're trying to keep it secret. But also, I think and again, it's another way that you might encounter Gif Yankee and Gif Zari yeah. in a more peaceful setting where they're not at each other's throats. But there yeah. just seems so little about it. It was like, oh, here's one general that runs it. You know, I, Don't worry I about genuinely it. <laughs> had exactly the same point. I was oh, really Shazal Cow. Is that how you'd say it? I, 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 don't I believe it is. <laughs> That's how we're going to say it. Okay. But yeah, it, it's sort of mentioned offhand that these two polar forces can get put together and they're trying to make amends or, or suddenly people are trying to to, to get them back. And, and yeah, it just sort of drops it in, doesn't do anything with it, and then leaves. And I think, oh, come on, you could have done another page just on that. Yeah, just, just oh. even like some key names of operatives or like notable operatives or, or stuff. I don't know. Cause I, I think, I guess all their stuff is very secret. Cause obviously they're, they're helping to, to discourage violence against the others and the common goal of fighting mind players. Yeah. I think the other possible bit, and I don't know why, but like, it feels like a, <laughs> it feels like a dick move that the GIF Yankees like, so to go back to it. So Val Keith, who is sort of the leader, basically GIF, Gif herself was the leader of the Gifsari, and then Val Keith was sort of a second in command. And and Val Keith was sort of said to Gif like, "Well, you know, to really beat the Mind Flayers, you should go ask Tiamat, who's just stuck in the Nine Hells. Maybe maybe you should go do that." And Gif's like, "Of course I'll do that," <laughs> and then, never seen again. And then and, uh, there's this relationship with dragons as a result. And then, again, there's a little bit of mention like, "Oh, by the way, they use dragons as steeds." I thought you've already got Skiffs. Why do you need a dragon as well to write about? I know, like, yeah, that, that is, like, there's a whole other plot point to that and, and what um, what the dragons want. And I think 
that's sometimes what I find these books get a little bit stuck with. Uh, I always read these books with the idea that they help the dungeon masters. Like they, they are geared to help campaigns and help dungeon masters run things more than to give players a little bit of understanding about stuff. So if I was running a campaign with the Gith Yankee and they had dragons and that was important to the campaign or, or how these things run, mm. I would want to know exactly why the dragons are there and what their purpose is. Whereas a couple of times in the chapter, it says Tiamat wants to do this because of reasons you don't understand. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's great. But if this is for a dungeon master, mm. I kind of do need to understand. Otherwise I've got to fill the blanks in and, and make something up, which is absolutely mm. fine. And, and I, and I enjoy doing that, but do you know what I mean? Sometimes mm. it doesn't quite know where to pitch it. And I, I do feel, and I, I don't know whether it's because we've been talking about them more or I've been mentioning them more, but I do feel there's a lot more information about the Gif Yankee than the Gif Sari. And I feel that the Gif Sari, because they're not fighters per se, they avoid direct conflict, they're more researchers and they're more sort of, not like the, the people behind the curtain, but I think they're fascinating. Mm. And there doesn't, I don't feel, I guess because obviously they're like, well, seclusion is best. We don't want to interact with anyone. Yeah. I just kind of wish there was a bit more on the structure. Well, and I say that, they've got, the, the whole fortress itself is a way they, they work out. They've got food stores and that's why they go to other planes to get more food and stuff like that because they can't grow anything mm. in, in limbo. I don't know. It just feels like, I guess, and I think this comes back to a lot, a, a point where I think, a lot of people struggle with D&D, perhaps. Certainly, I, I know we talked about this, you know, off podcast, but like, because D&D has always been a combat simulator, but with the latest additions, obviously, there's now room for more storytelling, more role play, and you could go through many sessions without fighting, and you don't have to fight every combat. Yeah. I mean, you might you might die, but, you know, and I, I feel like, oh, well, the GIF Yankee, because they're aggressive, and that you're going to face them more here's all the information about that. And so there's a lot more in it. Whereas the Gifsari, because you're, cause you're not going to necessarily fight them. I mean, you shouldn't fight the Gifsari, a Gif Yankee anyway. Mm. But I just feel as a result, like, oh, well, you're just going to leave them alone. Like, what business have you with them? But right? Yeah. I, you know. Three times as many pages the Gif Yankee have really? compared to the Gifsari. Yeah, oh. just, just counting it now. And you're right. I think it's, it, it's aimed that way because it thinks with combat comes more opportunity to, to do things. Yeah. Saying that though, I've I've got the distinct impression through this, you know, podcast so far that you you would probably enjoy and you associate more with the GIF Yankee or find them more interesting than the GIF Zari. I mean, is there anything in particular that draws one over the other for you, or is is, is it the lack of information on the other, or more that you just can't shake your inner barbarian? Like, what's the <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you thinking? Yeah, who's Aubrey? Uh, no, I. I think it's a mixture of not as much on the Gifsari for sure, but I do feel like the Gif Yankee have this paradoxical thing where they're warriors, so they're trained and they're, they've known this whole thing and they're going to fight. But then you get to the astral plane and they're all bored, I, well, I assume bored rich people who may be fat. Like, I, <laughs> I, but I just, I just imagine that they're gorging themselves or there's a luxury element there that feels so at odds with this fighter, we're going to destroy, you know, like I, just, I, yeah. I don't, I don't, it just seems such a weird paradox to me. Like this, again, it's sort of this rich person's or rich sort of perspective sending out the poorer, the more inexperienced people to go fight their wars. And then they come back and then once they've proven themselves, they can then join the ranks. Yeah. And it's not, it's not what there's been promised per se. They either are so experienced, they do so well that then their souls get eaten or they've done their job and now they do nothing for the rest of existence. And it rem um, weirdly, there's um, I don't uh, I don't know I don't know how up you are on your sort of uh, classic uh, period dramas, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. So I, I'll admit I haven't read many, but there was this sort of common thing where once a woman had got to a certain age, they'd get married and have kids, and that was it. And so by the time they were twenty five or or even thirty, they'd have a family. They would. It was a this, this, this description of boredom that they would have. This sort of like they have become twisted version of themselves because they have nothing to do all day. Because the kids get looked after by servants, the houses get cleaned, they just sit in the drawing rooms, maybe singing or, or doing trivial tasks and, and sort of mind numbingly boring 
things. Uh, whereas the men obviously would go out, uh, go go do business or, or, or anything like that. So it's interesting to read sort of period dramas now, because obviously a lot of it is about women getting married. Certainly if you think of Pride and Prejudice or mm. Emma or anything like that. They, they, and it's so important that women get married young, because once they turn a certain age, they become... Uh, they're on the shelf though they're spinsters or all that sort of thing <laughs> and it, yeah and so that's that's how I feel like it, it's like once it's a goal for a gift yankee to prove themselves to be the best of the best and then once they've done it and it's rubbish whatever they get is rubbish like because they just don't yeah. have a purpose anymore it's taken away from them but they're told that this is the this is the best thing they could ever hope for yeah. to the point to the point that twiddling their thumbs looking to to go on any mission any raid at all exactly and to to the point where you have raiding parties come back and people say you better have brought back some sort of new entertainment for us or something because otherwise what's the point in you coming back and that is like mind-blowing in a way that you can't come back unless you have something good (laughs) to to give us i was like wow no it, it, it is it is interesting, isn't it? I mean, when I was reading it, I, the, the inner DM me, I, I do enjoy the the gif uh, the gif Zari, mm. just just purely because of of like the the more complicated nature they have with the with the world, if that makes sense. The yeah. the gif Yankee are great fun and complicated, but there is that baseline. We're just going to rage and pillage and murder where we can because we have a right to it, mm-hmm. and that's really good fun to get into. But the Gives Zari just a, it's more complicated. It, it, it's sort of a combination of revenge, survival, and logic that only kind of makes sense to them. And whilst the book doesn't really give that much information on them, it gives enough. And mm. yeah, I just like imagining, yeah, just putting them in. I, I just imagine one of those adamantine fortresses just yeah. sort of boom, bumping into the middle of a city or, or like in the outskirts of some wild near a, a continent the players know and then everybody has to sort of deal with it um mm. i just oh, find that fascinating. that would be that actually would be really cool that you have to deal with a githari fortress that's just appeared over the town of Waterdeep or, or, or Neverwinter or uh, that sort of thing and you're like shit because like looking at it here they are essentially just massive spaceships yeah. And like reading about the, the the plants and food is sort of grown in pens and and stuff like that. Like you think of like in Alien or anything like that. Everything's in like a, a green in in a greenhouses or even the video game Prey. It's just a whole greenhouse. You know, making stuff. It's all scientifically done because you can't grow anything in Limbo. God, that'd be so cool. Actually, having I don't know I'd, how would he, how would a party even deal with like a Gisari? Like okay, we, we <laughs> it's there. What the fuck do you do about it? <laughs> what do you do? Because <laughs> you can't really go and knock on the door. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, sorry to bother you, but <laughs> which one of these huge adamantine sides lets us in? Like, what do we do? <laughs> Still, it's better go than around. coming across the long dead corpse of a huge demigod that once died and now has a throne of bones oh. carved into it. That's a. <laughs> it's- it's such a statement. I love it. Like, <laughs> it's just, a, oh, it's so cool. Like, in, and in my head, it's like, she's so cool. As I always say with all the evil bad geniuses that, that you present in our campaign, and if they're female, I'm like, that's really cool. When it's a guy, I'm like, ah, oh, it's all right. I mean, it's not a woman, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, just, I just find them really interesting. I'm trying to imagine how they fit into the material plane and why would they be there and how are the adventurers going to, to sort of spread in? I liked the, the reference to the silver sword and mm. if the silver sword gets lost into somebody's hands, then, you know, the Lich Queen will send people out to go and retrieve the sword. And that normally means pretty nasty death for like right, everybody, got it. <laughs> yeah. everybody else. Um, I like the idea that you could try and, and engage in a sort of political campaign with high level characters where you're trying to find some sort of peace or unification or, or something, or, or maybe negotiating a peace treaty with the Gibzari, for instance, to mm. get them to leave a particular area, or maybe you're helping them. Or mm. Actually, it, we were talking about the balance recently um, in, in terms of Devils v. Demons and Mordekainen and a lot of these grand master wizards and how they deal with the world. And maybe in this endless war, one side has got the advantage over the other and you're sent in to to knock an advantage or two off one side to balance it up. I don't know if that would be a good way of doing it. Yeah, because that's what they're sort of um, 
this is where I'm going to pronounce it wrong, the their sort of resistance, the Sha Shoal, that one uh, <laughs> does. But I just I just remembered. Um, so Gifzari had had a her leader, which name I've got down here, uh, it's Zerf Imon. Zerf Imon, um, who who died. They challenged Gith and lost, and and then oh they oh they that's the reason they went to the the uh, play the Limbo. Play Limbo. But now there's these these uh, Gisari called Zerfs who sort of act as the like spreading the word of uh, Zergimoth Zer um, and say that he will return to us and it'll be better. But it's not religious. It no. is purely philosophical and just a way of thinking. And again, that reminds me so much of if you think of any sort of not not and that's the thing I'm going to get religion confused with uh, philosophy here, even though I did do philosophy. So apologies in advance. But, <laughs> The idea it's a way of life like <laughs> and 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 adhering to these things and as a result uh, your life will be better so completely different to the gifts are where they're saying like violence and, and you need to prove yourself to be the best warrior this is just something different of just like uh like was it sh sharing knowledge on how to fight evil like the mind yeah. flayers and the gift yankee <laughs> yeah maybe that would be a good way of putting it into a campaign you've got a missionary that's maybe in a city or maybe there's a monastery that's been set up and has been insidiously taken mm. over by the gifts are that would be cool yeah like maybe they want to be um emissaries or advisors to some sort of king or queen is a a Gibzari who was genuinely trying to help them, but with the idea that there's also Gif Yankee that may attack the area in the next 10 years and they're mm. getting them ready for it or something. I Difficult, isn't it? You, you could, oh man, you could play like a, a Gibzari Zerf, like doing almost like a Book of Mormon. You've, you're there to preach the good, good news. And then you're like, wait, <laughs> what's going on? Why am I in, why am I in this terrible, terrible place? <laughs> like that that could be quite fun. Yeah, like the sort of the naivety of like um oh the the like uh, they're called like elders and sisters. Mm. Oh, this is this is dangerous territory for me, so I apologize. <laughs> yeah, but like being an elder version of a Zarf, that could be quite interesting. Yeah. Oh, I it like that. Really good. It really, really good. <laughs> So there we go, the GIF. I, I think they're really interesting. I, so and definitely, good. again, another example of D&D trying to put some higher level entities into a game, which I find is is interesting. I mean, again, you look through the challenge ratings of all of these GIF <laughs> in the books, and they're all, I don't think there's a single one below challenge rating 10. No. So, I mean, that get, you've got a raiding party of like half a dozen or a dozen of these things. That is an almost impossible fight for most people. Like, mm. that is ridiculously difficult so i enjoy that and, and i enjoy okay. having more like high level content in the game um to sort of put things through you never know i might chuck these guys at please you at do point. not these these people <laughs> sound awful <laughs> <laughs> oh man you've got me thinking about how to put them into a campaign now no really, no let's let's, let's move on ryan what's the next topic what are we gonna read about next time well, we've spent a few weeks going through like battles and wars effectively. And mm -hmm. I kind of, I was linking it back to something I'd talked about before and, and maybe taking it a little bit more simple. So we're going to go back to the monster manual, the oh. original, one of the original three. And we're going to be talking about dragons and everything oh. dragon-like. Uh, okay. Differences between metallic and chromatic and oh, good. the purposes <laughs> in their fights with giants and their interactions with humanoids and all that kind of stuff. So that should be fun. Oh, cool. I literally know nothing about dragons. And that's, <laughs> well, like, will one, soon. And that's like one of the main things in Dungeons and Dragons. Well, oh, I thought so as well. J dragons are one of the most misunderstood creatures in Dungeons and Dragons, and they have had sweeping changes in this edition. So it'll be fun to go through. God, uh, the most misunderstood monster in D and D is the dragon. Is that what, is that your tagline? For this? That's, that's, I'm going to put it out there. I don't know if I could back that up, but it feels like that's a true statement. Wow! Oh, brilliant! I, well, I can't I can't wait to to you know, it's like change my mind because I think <laughs> I think they're pretty evil. But what do I know? <laughs> we shall see. We shall see. Oh well, Ryan, thank you so much for that. Do you have anything you would like to plug? Where will we find you on the socials and not not necessarily in real life, but what what 
are you up to, man? What's, what's, what's going <laughs> oh, on? These guys know where to find me if they want to. I'm us around on YouTube. We do TBA Mondays on YouTube. I'm on Discord and Twitter and all the fun places. Um, I don't get as up to as much as you, Fiona, though. You've got all kinds of projects going on. I'm sure you're doing something way more interesting than me. I just need to be doing things. That's that's what I've discovered. So <laughs> I run uh, What Am I Rolling? The Oh my god, I forgot what it was. Uh, okay, my own thing. My own. I've thing. forgotten my own thing. Ah, I'm doing <laughs> too many things. So, so I am running. What am I rolling? A twice monthly RPG one shot podcast, which is going super super well. I'm hoping to do probably a few more solo uh, RPGs, which I've got stuff uh, downloaded. There's uh, one called Artifact, where you play a magical weapon or a, or an artifact, and you describe oh, wow. your story as you go along, which sounds pretty fun. There's a thousand year old vampire, which I think is self explanatory. Uh, <laughs> you are only a teenage and you're trying to get to a thousand years, maybe. <laughs> Just stick it off. And then the last one, which looks really fun, is called Quill, where you have to, like, it's like almost like competitive letter writing where you get a oh, wow. scenario and you have to write a letter. I think it's under five minutes, but you have to include certain things that you roll and then you roll the result about how they found your letter. And oh, wow. it sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, Hopefully those will be the ones I'll be doing at some point. Uh, That's really cool. Yeah. That's really, really cool. Well, until then, you'll have to wait until hearing all that and then some stuff about dragons. And <laughs> thank you for listening as ever. We'll see you next time. All right, bye. Bye. <laughs>